A good day to all of you out there listening. This is the Friendship News Hour presented to you by Bummer Dude Media. Today is April the 21st, 2022. His name is Alex. My name is Frank. Al, I have an announcement to make. Okay. I have some news to share. Mm -hmm. This news was unplanned and uh, I'm here to share it in front of you and God and all of these people. I am the newest owner of a pair of Crocs. <laughs> really thought you were going to go another way with that one. Yeah, yeah, I know. You, you thought. <laughs> you thought. Well, I, I mean, that's some of the best news I could have received this evening. I suppose. Tell me all about it. The thought process behind it. Where were you? How, how do you make your decision? Oh, it wasn't my idea. Ah, okay. It was bestowed upon me. By Some one might amazing say person. Forced. <laughs> yes, by uh, the greatest lady in the world. Uh, it was a part of my birthday present. And oh, I, that's beautiful. I felt the Amazon package and I threw it on the bed. I said, I'm not <laughs> opening that. <laughs> I know exactly what that is, devil woman. I wear my Crocs every single day, Frank. Every day. That is not snowing outside. I'm wearing them currently. Nice. What'd you, so what'd you get? Yeah. You got black, beige, black. camo. Okay, black. black. Nice. Yeah, I got some black cracks. And uh, yeah, they're they're convenient. They're very functional. Um, they do feel very good on your feet. Mm -hmm. I like the little bumpy massage. But here's the thing that I still cannot understand. Why must they look so goofy? Uh, yeah, I don't think whoever designed them was in like the mind frame of I, I want to make something fashionable. I think it was literally all for comfort. You need the space yeah. in there. You need the airflow. You know, it's it's for people. I mean, it's for all kinds of people. Nurses wear them. I, I wear them. You know, I, I, my brother wears them. I, probably because his feet smell like complete garbage, and it aerates them, makes them you know makes them stay fresh. Uh, I I think they're really just for anyone. You can garden with them. You know, you could you could really do anything. They're very functional. Yeah, incredibly functional. Um, but man, are they ugly? But name me God, one fashionable shoe that's functional. I mean, look, flip flops are they 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 make they make they do the, they do the same thing. They do the same job to me. Yeah, but you're showing more skin, and people don't want to see all that. You know, like this is Crocs are kind of like sexy in that like <laughs> <laughs> said said one man ever. <laughs> They're sexy in that you you know a foot's under there, but you don't see the foot. With flip flops, it's okay. like I'm seeing untrimmed nails. I'm seeing mm. corns. You know, I'm mm -hmm. seeing all the shit I don't want to see. So. Mm -hmm. I think Crocs is a little bit of a safer bet, but I, I love a flip flop. Don't get me wrong. This is the the Puritan News Hour. We're going <laughs> to have to start covering up more and more around here. <laughs> oh, dude! Uh, I just came back from the most magical place in the whole world, Frank. Disneyland. Ah, oh, the factory. Disney's got their own thing going on, but I just came back from the factory. The factory of cheesecake. Oh yeah. <sighs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. The menu to kill all menus. Dude. Cheesecake yeah. factory. Literally, yeah. Fattest menu. Anything you want, they pretty much have. We know what I, what comes to mind for as long as I will ever live um, when I think of Cheesecake Factory mm. is in uh, 2020, and it was during all that madness in 2020, in the summer of 2020. And somebody somebody was reporting the news outside of a cheesecake factory, and they, somebody just walks by with a whole ass cheesecake, and, and they obviously had just stolen it. And she goes, well, "Somebody's walking there with a cheesecake. Uh, don't know really know where they might have gotten that from." <laughs> She's standing right in front of a cheesecake factory. Says it right in front, of, trying to cover it for this guy who just stole a cheesecake. It's the most incredible video in the in the whole internet. I can't imagine what those actually cost though, because I think it's like nine bucks a slice, and there's probably fifteen slices in a cheesecake. Ten, ten to fifteen. It's like a ninety dollar pie, man. Really, it's that much? Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, dude. Yeah, our our bill was not cheap, but it was delicious, man. I mean, you, you get the it's the full service when you get walk in there. You walk in there, and it's like. No place you've ever seen. It's like out of a storybook with all the walls and the waves and the pillars. And it's crazy. And then you sit at your table and instantly a fresh basket of bread is brought to you with two variations. You have the pumpernickel, I think is it, it is, the, the brown bread and a sourdough loaf. And then just the most perfect butter square you'll ever see in the world on a plate. And it, it's not too firm. It's not too soft. It's just the perfect spreading buoyancy viscosity mm -hmm. i don't even know what you'd say but it's perfect and you, you're just instantly you're in a good mood you're spreading butter on bread what else what else do you want in the world and then yeah i mean like i'm you happy said, for you man <laughs> you open the menu and it's huge but what really we had the way you're describing this it's incredible <laughs> 
it's a, it's a place that I hold very special in my heart, which is so funny because like to most people it's probably fucking nothing. But like when when I when I grew up in Toledo and we'd come to Chicago like maybe like once a year every two years, going to the Cheesecake Factory was like this thing because like they were nowhere around us. Mm. So like to get to go to the Cheesecake Factory was such a big thing. So like it's been built up in my head for my whole life. I feel like. But have you ever had their avocado egg rolls? I think I've been to the Cheesecake Factory like twice in my life. What really? Yeah, it was never it was never a place that we went really. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, hey, that's fine. Uh, to each his own. But to me, it's a place that I hold dear. And their avocado egg rolls. If you're ever looking for an appetizer on that menu, I cannot suggest them highly enough. Uh, and then I got the chicken avocado club this evening. And finished it with the tiramisu cheesecake, which I, I thought was going to be better than it was. I'm not going to lie. First time having it. Was a little disappointed. What, a, what an evening. <laughs> it was quite the evening. I'm sorry. What I got a meal, man. really passionate. I think I'm like sweating talking about it. but No, you did. I was just, I was really happy to hear you keep going about that. <laughs> I'm sorry. There's so much more important shit to talk about than that, but uh, that's where I'm at. So now I can't move. So I'm here. Nice. Mm -hmm. Nice. Well, I, I don't know. I feel like now I'm going to have to go to Cheesecake Factory. I'm trying to think of a place that was like built up in my head. That's like not like, I guess, I guess you could say that Cheesecake Factory is like objectively amazing, but I'm trying to think of a place that was like built in my head that I, that I would like only go to a couple of, I think maybe uh white castle, yeah. but I was disappointed in white castle. Yeah. When right. I finally got there, I was like, wow, this is ass. Why'd they make an entire movie about this? <laughs> what else? Uh, Sonic. Oh yeah. Sonic yeah. was a big ass deal when it came to San Diego. Cause they do, dude, I don't know how it was in, in San Diego, but in Toledo, we didn't have one for like five years and they would advertise the fuck out of it, bro. To the point where we would drive like an hour away to Indiana and go get it. Cause it was like, dude, Oh my God, Sonic. We never understood that because we would see the commercials incessantly, yeah. but there was, but there was only one. The closest one was in uh, Arizona. Weird. Oh wow. Damn. That's far. Yeah. 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 It didn't make any sense. So maybe that was their ploy. Maybe they just like got it in your heads. And then once they got there, they were like, Oh, fuck, I thought I yeah. They're good commercials. I got to give it to Sonic. They do have good commercials. Those guys in the yeah. car are funny. They're good. Yeah, they're pretty funny. To me, and I know you hold this place very dear, but like in and out I, I thought was just like, eh. Like there's so much hype around it. And I was just like, oh, okay. That's just like a, it's a cheeseburger restaurant. Like nothing crazy. Not not that it's bad. Like I, I would never say it's bad, but. Yeah, it's, I think it's like when you're talking about fast food, you know, like mm -hmm. in and out's tops. It's fresh, quick. It is fresh. And it's really tasty. And it was just like a staple out, out here and everyone loves it. And it's really tasty, but I could see you coming from like out of town, having like your own you know, delicious, delectable burgers that you know and love. And then you come in, you just try like a basic ass double cheeseburger with some Thousand Island dressing. And you're like, oh. <laughs> My biggest complaint about In-N-Out is their fries, bro. They dry up instantly. Their ass. Their ass, bro. Yeah. yeah like, come on, man. Um, the burger is good. Animal style, fuck with it. I love it. But yeah, yeah. Um, they're okay. The, the, the fries, the problem with the fries is like normal. They're not great, but then you can get them extra crispy, but then they don't become fries. They just become chips. Oh, yeah. You know I don't what I think mean? I've ever done that. Extra crispy. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. But I do like In N Out. I, I like it way better than I like Five Guys. See, that's just, I disagree. Disagree. Five Guys is just a, just a punch in your stomach, man. Every time you go, it's just so much food. It's so greasy. And you control the food quantity, though. You can get a single, you can get a double, a triple, whatever you want. You can get bacon. Yeah. That's where In N Out doesn't have bacon. They don't no. have eggs. They don't have barbecue. Like I just they think have that eggs at the at the Five Guys. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. At Five Guys, what I like is you can customize your burger to do whatever the fuck you want, and like that's more the idea. They're like more of a sit down restaurant. In N Out's like you get this. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like this or fuck off, basically. So it's like right. But it's a fast food place. You're In N Out. It's supposed to be quick. You know. Yeah. So I think they're like different. But I, food wise, I'd rather eat a Five Guys burger over In N Out any day. I feel that their fries are definitely better. <sighs> oh yeah. You get so many of those bitches. Yeah. And you get peanuts while you wait. They still do that. I haven't been to a five guys in probably at least six years. At Man, least. I went when we were in Colorado last year and I don't remember if they had the peanuts. I feel like COVID would end that. Yeah. Probably. I don't know. I mean, COVID's in the air, but not on surfaces, but I feel like dude, any company, if there's a way to cut costs and blame COVID. Right. Exactly. They're going to take it. Like, fuck exactly. it. Exactly. We don't need to give these people peanuts. Fuck that shit. COVID. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder how much they spent on peanuts every year. Probably yeah, a lot, right? dude. Because it was just big giant bags. Do you have, did you guys have Lone Stars out there back in the day? Like Steakhouse? Yeah. 
Uh, I think we have one. I've never been. Dude, Lone Star we have actual steakhouses here too. Well, yeah, for sure. Fuck you. But uh, <laughs> in Toledo, we all, I, used, I always used to go with my dad. It was the coolest shit because at Lone Star Steakhouse, they gave you peanuts when you sat down and you could just throw them bitches on the ground. That's how you got oh, rid of your peanuts was just discard them on the ground. And then someone slipped and they got sued and that ended quickly. Mm. But that was always <laughs> the coolest shit. I don't know why. <laughs> Bring back the peanuts on the floor. Damn yeah. it. <laughs> Think about going in there with a peanut allergy, though. You'd be so fucked. Oh, I know, right? <laughs> and think about that. You know what I heard about uh, peanut aller- allergies, like nut allergies, specifically peanut allergies, hmm. is that the more that you remove them from society, the more society gets allergic to them. Hmm. Okay. So it's like a rolling. So like the next generation of children will be more allergic to peanuts than the generation before them. If the trend continues oh, that we don't expose children to peanuts as much. That makes sense to me. Yeah, for yeah. sure. I could not imagine. So I, I had a, a coworker in town this week and um, she's married to a Russian dude. And I've been asking all about like what that's like and how, you know, how he's doing, how his family's doing this, that, and the other, and like where they come from. And, and they came from a really poor area of Russia. And he like got this lottery ticket to come to, to uh, the United States and his, his grandparents were in uh, central California. Is he a spy? Uh, my maybe, I mean, honestly, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> the lottery like ticket? That, that, Is that what, that's, that's how the Americans went. Right. Um, <laughs> did you ever watch that show? The Americans? Yeah. yeah. I never finished yeah, yeah, yeah. it though, dude. I'm pissed. Yeah. Yeah, um, anyways, he said that when he was in Russia and when he was like at his family home and they didn't have very much, like no running water, no bathrooms or nothing, they would get packages from the United States from their grandparents and his favorite thing was peanut butter. Mm. Oh yeah, because he didn't, he couldn't get peanut butter. Weird. And in so, Russia. Yeah. Well, I guess they just lived in a really poor, poor, poor oh, gotcha. rural area, like yeah, four yeah, or five yeah. hours outside of Moscow. Just they did, they just didn't have much. Hmm. Um, but yeah, peanut butter. I could imagine a, a world without peanuts or peanut butter. I was just at the Padre game on Monday, uh, and the, instead of buying like nachos or a sandwich, I wanted peanuts. Yeah. No, they're delicious at a baseball game. Especially. Game. Yeah. yeah, dude, so good. I used to eat peanuts whole. That might disgust you a little bit. Oh, uh, why? Because I loved the buttery, salty taste of the shell. Yeah, but that disappears after like 20 seconds, and then you're just chewing on peanut fiber. Yeah. Did yeah. you enjoy that? Uh, the taste of it, I, I very much so did, yes. The next morning, when it would exit my body, I did not. So mm. after so many times, when Sarah worked at the Cubs, we like went to a lot of games. I'd eat a lot of peanuts. It's a dark year. I'm not following. Can you please give more detail? <laughs> it hurt exiting me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. I guess we should start this oh. show officially. Yeah, probably. Fucking off a little bit too much. Actually, real quick fun fact, though. Please Dude, tell me. I didn't know this. I learned something t- this week. Do you know what the difference is between espresso and coffee? Like, actually what the difference is? The way that it's ground? Yes. But did yeah. you know that like espresso is a coffee bean? It's not a separate espresso no, bean. I did not know that. Isn't that crazy? I always thought it was it was two different things. Oh like no, it, no, you're saying it's it's still the same bean. It's just the way it's yeah, yeah, ground and yeah, and how yeah, how yeah, it's yeah. prepared. Never mm-hmm. knew that. Never fucking knew that. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I had pulled up this article because it just kind of blew my mind. But like, there's there's differences in the roast, the grind, the brewing of it, the taste, and actually like a big misconception is that. Espresso does not have more caffeine than normal, like drip coffee. Right. It's just like per ounce it does because of the concentration. Right. Yeah, exactly. Because they roast it more. The more you roast a coffee bean, the less caffeine it has in it. Exactly. That's why my my favorite coffees are like light and fruity and have almost like a blueberry kind of like essence. I don't know, like like not not the flavor, but like but like the smell and the aroma is kind of like fruity and blueberry. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, for sure. Like those blonde kind of roasts. Yeah, but yeah, a little, yeah, there, there's a, there's a roaster down here in San Diego called Dark Horse uh, Coffee. Shout out to Dark Horse. They're like right up the street from me. I fucking love them. They have a, I'll, I should send you a pack. They have a, a, a roast called Odd Harmonics and it's like the essence of what my favorite coffee is. It's so good because like, to me, there's way more like flavor. There's like, it's like way more of like a complex, like uh, flavor profile than like a dark roast coffee. I've just, I have completely lost my love for dark roast coffees. Yeah. I can't drink them. Oh, you can't now. Don't even, want I don't them. like them at all. To me, it just, to me, it just tastes like, uh, it just tastes like burnt shit. Yeah. Kinda. Yeah. I'll take it either way. I like it both ways, but I have Do become you? more of a blonde. I've been doing a lot of like blonde espresso lately. Like at the, at Starbucks, they have those, those oat milk shaken espresso drinks. Have you had one of those yet? Mm-mm, no. Bro. So fucking good. I do one extra shot of the blonde espresso and it's, 
it's a shit ton of caffeine. I think it's like 250 to 300 milligrams of caffeine. So you're feeling That's good. Right. Light them up. Yeah. But it, it's pretty delicious drink and only like 200 calories. So fucks with it. But yeah, I, I saw that. I was talking to my mom this weekend. And I'm like, no, I'm pretty sure it's a different bean. Uh, <laughs> I this article. I'm like, I don't know what I'm talking about. Apparently. Mom, please. please. <laughs> the adults are in the room. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the more you know, it's it's just about how it's made, ground, and like obviously when you make espresso, it's very compact and pressurized, and then super hot water shoots through it, so it's just a whole different thing. Well, thanks for clearing that up. <laughs> it's been weighing on me, but to the news. Uh, Elon Musk, have you heard about his, his latest? Uh, I saw that he offered to buy them outright at like 20% higher share than they were at, and that he's got the conglomerates and the people ready to go, but... It's continuing to develop. That's interesting because I, I forget when we leave off this kind of stuff, when we talk about it and then where it ends up traveling in, in the, in the news cycle. Mm. So last time we spoke, he just bought, he just bought in the shares and we were like, oh, okay. So it looks like he's being primed to actually go after Twitter. And then I think like a day after we had recorded, he made an offer to buy Twitter. Yep. And then all of the uh, people came out and were saying, uh, all the shareholders were like, no, no, I don't think we want to do this. Um, <laughs> we talked about the poison pill and, and yep. that's a hundred percent on the table. And that's where they dilute uh, the other shareholders, uh, shares so that, uh, he can never own more than 15% and, and can't have a majority stake in the company, which dilutes all the other shareholders, uh, in Twitter, uh, all their shares. So, uh, they're not acting in the best interest of their shareholders at all. Mm. But I wanted to, uh, let the people know that before Elon Musk decided that he was going to buy these shares in Twitter, these were the 10 largest shareholders of Twitter. You ready for this? Number one, the Vanguard Group. Number two, Morgan Stanley. Number three, BlackRock. We've talked about BlackRock. They literally own everything. I mean, that's not hyperbole. Google BlackRock. If, if you're listening to this, pause. Google BlackRock. If you don't know who they are, and you'll be astonished at just how much uh, money they're worth. Number four, State Street Corp. Number five, Aristotle Capital Management. Number six, Fidelity Investments. Number seven, ARK Investments. Number eight, Clearbridge Investments. Number nine, Geode Capital Management. Number 10, Barclays. The top 10 shareholders in Twitter are all funds. All of them. Mm -hmm. Fucking wild, dude. Yeah. Why is that? Why is that? Twitter doesn't make that much money. Yeah, I wouldn't think they would. They don't make that much money. I mean, maybe it's a good investment. I don't know. I'm not that deep into it. But why are the top 10 biggest shareholders all investment groups? Yeah, I'd want to see that. that for the other social media platforms. Because like, I think when we said last time, I looked it up. And based on active users, Twitter was like 15. And like Facebook way ahead, mm -hmm. TikTok mm -hmm. was way ahead, Instagram. Like, I'd love to see those boards. Like, is TikTok, they're, pu or I'm sorry, is Facebook publicly owned? Like, oh, yeah. They, they are. Yeah. So, oh, yeah, for sure. All that meta, they're meta now and, and yeah, and the stock exchange, but yeah, it's publicly traded. Yeah. So, I'd be really curious to see the other sites, like if that's just something that they do or if they're like trying to control the message on Twitter or like what that really means. Um, yeah. You know, I don't know what this particular set of facts means like what these owners mean for Twitter. But what I know one thing that it does mean that anybody talking about Elon Musk shouldn't be another billionaire in uh, owning the media. They're all billionaires that own the media, every one of them. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I, you know, it, it, and obviously I, that's what it takes, right? Like you need that much money to do something drastic. It's just what it is. Do you think it's foolish to like trust Elon though? Because like I feel way different about Elon than I do than like the you know Ted Turner or whoever like people that own these other big ass news corporations, whatever. Like another billionaire owning it. Like I, I would trust Elon with that responsibility. Like I, I don't think that like the things I've seen him do, he's out for the good of just humans in general. Like he's trying to make us you know become the first interplanetary species by having life on Mars. And he's trying to do all these different things transportation wise to, you know, save carbon emissions here in America, building a tunnel under LA to help with traffic. Like he, he's someone who I, I think like the proof's in the pudding. And, and a lot of people might even say like with Bernie Sanders, even though he's got some crazy more socialist policies, but like the proof's in the pudding with those guys where they have a track record of like doing good or at least standing by their word. So it's like, if we're going to trust somebody with the reins, I have no problem Saying, Daddy Elon, you know, take the reins, do it. Go ahead. Yeah, man. I, 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 can't, I can't knock the intentions. And I think really the, the, you can boil it down to like the, the simplest reason why 
you don't like why somebody like you and I could trust Elon with such a ridiculous responsibility and comparing him to, to Bernie Sanders, I think is acute here because what Elon Musk does is just tells the truth. When Russia first invaded Ukraine and we saw our gas prices spike, he went right to Twitter and he said, we should probably drill for way more oil and become way, way less dependent on foreign oil. And he's the owner of the biggest electric vehicle car company out there. It's right. Like, like he's not afraid to tell the truth. It doesn't matter what his interests are. And we've, like you said, the proof's in the pudding. He's done that time and time and time again, very reasonable. I think, you know, a really sharp cat with, with all the best intentions. Do I trust him to run Twitter? That's another story. Uh, we're going to go over a thread, actually a Twitter thread by, uh, the former CEO of Reddit, Yashan Wong, uh, in a minute that, that might offer a little bit of clarity there, but let me just get to the facts of what's going on right now. Cause some news came out today that, uh, that, Elon Musk announced that he has the funds to buy Twitter. He pretty much showed the receipts. He said he's lined up $46.5 billion for his, his uh, bid to take over Twitter. And it consists of $25 billion from a group of banks, Morgan Stanley, Bank of America, and Barclays. Uh, $21 billion in his own personal equity. Damn. The Wall Street Journal describes this as the deal-making equivalent of a down payment on a home, $21 wow. billion. Yeah. Uh, it makes up a, a, a lot of shares in Tesla. His This is like his collateral for this money. A lot of shares in Tesla, and then he's probably going to have to liquidate some from SpaceX and the Boring Company. But Twitter's probably going to reject this bid, probably, right? We, we know that they're willing to do everything that they can to make sure that he has the hardest time doing this. But he's also considered what's called a tender offer. It's complicated, but essentially what it does is it takes the it takes the bid to all of their shareholders and not the board. So he basically offers this to all Twitter shareholders and says, okay, the board doesn't want to do what's in your best interest. What do you guys want to do, essentially? And then he offers this sale to them. And and then, you know, they, they can make that decision and not the board. So it looks like it's going to get kind of ugly because the Twitter board is going to reject this and then he's going to do what he can to try and force it regardless of what they want to do. Now, you raise the question, what does that mean, right? Is he the guy for the job? And there is an incredibly interesting perspective by uh, Yashan Wong, who is the former CEO of Reddit. So he has a lot of history with social media platforms and how they work. So he uh, acknowledges on Twitter that he's been asked for his take on what Elon Musk is trying to do. And essentially, he starts this thread by saying, you know, Elon Musk comes from a different time in the internet, right? Where censorship meant you know, pornography and gore and things like that. Right. Um, and he basically says that he likes that novelty, that idea of what the internet used to be. He loves the romanticism of it, but basically he's saying that it's not the same internet. And so he thinks that Elon Musk is in a, for a world of pain, if he decides to go forward and buy Twitter the way he's doing it. And you know, he goes into a ton of really interesting uh, topics. He says here that that Twitter in is representative of the entire internet, and that the internet is a frontier for the culture wars. It's basically like the battlefield for the culture wars. Um, he makes this really good point, and I and I love this here. He he goes, all my left wing woke friends are convinced that social media platforms uphold the white supremacist, misogynistic patriarchy, and they have plenty of screenshots and evidence of times when the platform has made enforcement decisions unfairly against innocuous things they said and let far more egregious sexist racist violations by the other side pass and then he asks my woke friends is this true you have a lot of examples and then he says all my all center right libertarian friends are convinced that social media platforms uphold the woke blm marxist lgbtq agenda and they also have plenty of screenshots and evidence of times when platforms have made enforcement decisions unfair against them for innocuous things that they've said and uh let far more egregious violations by the other side stand and then he asks this is correct right and it, it's so true I and mean, that, that almost perfectly describes the the breakdown of what Twitter is, what the internet is. And he acknowledges that. He said, neither side is lying, uh, mostly because enforcement is not easy. And there's a ton of errors 
to be made. And then he asks, like, you know, think about your political, uh, your political lean, where your your lean is. And if you think about that, you know, you probably know that one of those two things uh, is true. And then he says, okay, now I'm going to reveal the institutional bias of every large social network, Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, what have you. He says, they would like you, the users, you and I, to stop squabbling over stupid shit and causing drama so that they can spend their time writing more features and not have to adjudicate your stupid little fights. Oh, so good. <laughs> it's so good. He goes, that's all. He said, they don't care about politics. They really don't. Donald Trump was not deplatformed for being right wing. And then he shares his, his additional thread about Omega events. And he, he really has a, uh, he makes a solid case for the reason that Donald Trump was deplatformed. And as we go through this tr thread, maybe you can think back to that example and then understand why, why that might be. He says, you know, the execs can be fill in whatever demographic, right? All men or employees uh, of these tech companies are all woke or whatever. But he, but he makes he, he, he emphasizes that they don't care about politics. And he, he noticed he, he, he makes note that Facebook used to be uh, way more right leaning and then left leaning and then a little bit in the middle and Reddit's has been the same and Twitter's has been the same and that the platforms themselves really don't care. They care about two things. One, money. They care about making money. They're publicly traded companies. Two, they want people to be civil. And he makes the point that if we were civil, if we st played a little bit nicer with each other, there would be absolutely no room for censorship. And he says that because the structure of the social networks, these the, the, the way that they're designed is not to curtail politics or ideas or what side is left or what side is right. It's to curtail behavior. That's it. It's to curtail behavior. And, you know, basically he says that it's not the topics. The topics aren't censored. It's behavior. He even brings up this quote. Uh, you hear this a lot. I think Joe Rogan says this like every other episode. Uh, the best antidote to bad ideas is to not censor them, but allow debate and better ideas. And he says that that's incredibly naive, that the debate that you're seeing on social media is not debate, which is true. And then he brings up one of the more prolific examples of censorship that's happened in the last couple of years, which is the lag leap, the lab leak theory, which is that the coronavirus originated in a lab in China and spread either maliciously or non maliciously from that source. And he said that it was censored at a certain time in history of the pandemic because the quote debate included massive amounts of horrible behavior, spam level posting, and abuse that spilled over into the real world. Example, harassment of public officials and doctors, racially motivated crimes, et cetera. I don't know what racially motivated crimes he's talking about with coronavirus, but if you think about it in those terms, it begins to make a little bit more sense why this stuff is being censored, no? Yeah, no, for sure. I think he's making a lot of good points here, man. He basically says that the lab leak theory wasn't censored because it was a wrong idea, but because ideas, uh, they, they really can at certain times and places become lightning rods for actual physical kinetic mob behavior, which is so true, man. Like, you can't say no to that. Like, that's 100 and 50% true. And he even says it, that it's it's unpleasant and an inconvenient truth, that it, it doesn't matter which way you lean, um, that ideas are powerful and with power comes danger and that idea, ideas can be dangerous. And this is true. And you can replace the lab leak theory with whatever you think has been unfairly censored. And he even shows this meme about, you know, why you think you were being blocked. And it shows this guy like, like standing up in a crowd, making a stand and people are looking up to him, admiring him. And then it says why you were actually blocked. And it's that dude from the history channel with the crazy hair. You've seen the meme, you know what I'm talking about. And it's so true. Like you're, you're not, you're not doing anything. You're just, it, it becomes that, that thing that makes everybody so torn up inside. And, uh, you know, he goes on to say that he thinks Twitter and, and, and Jack Dorsey have done a good job and that he's, that Jack Dorsey was, you know, his last years of, of running Twitter were probably, probably good. But then he goes into Jack Dorsey, the man. And he says, there's a reason why Jack has a crazy meditation routine and eats one meal a day and goes on spiritual retreats because it takes an inhuman level of mentality to be able to run something like this. I would never, I would never once in a million years want to do anything like that. No, no take, way. Take on that. Right. It just sounds like an asshole thing to, to want to like pursue. 
And he says, because the problems aren't about politics or topics of discussion. They're always about the way humans misbehave when there are no immediate visible consequences when talking to essentially strangers and the endless ingenuity they display trying to get around rules. So true. It's so true. We act like there's no consequences when we say things on the internet. The consequences, I think, are, you know, I think I think what he's trying to say is like Twitter and Facebook and these things that we participate in, but we disdain to some degree are monsters of our own creating. That we have done this to that and that it's not the executives being woke and it's not that, uh, uh, you know, a, a right winger is is under attack because his views are popular or vice versa with with somebody who's left leaning. It's because we behave like fucking children on the Internet. <laughs> we we just drop our pants and take a shit every time we get on. We want to talk about something. Dude, it's crazy, man. Looking at my at my dad's like generation, too, I feel like it's so much so many people that like think the same way. But like where it's just like a never ending like argument. I, I don't know. Like at a point, like it gets to be where it's just people that think the way he is. But like you see so many people like that will literally just long threads and just try to like you're like making points back and forth with like a comment and then another comment. And it's like how he's talking about debate. It's like that's not debate. I, I guess it is because like in person you would debate where you make a point and then they make a point. But when it's online, dude, it's like such a, it's so much more petty to me for some reason than like sitting there and having like a face to face discussion about something that you disagree with and you're like trying to maybe find common ground or change someone's opinion or do whatever. But like online, it's like so it's not like monitor like you're saying or anything like that. It's just like, let me try to like make you look like a dumb fuck and like prove you wrong. Like I, it's so different. I don't know how, but it is different. Well, I, I think about it like this when you're trying to make a poignant point. Right. When you've thought out what you've said and then you press send, what percentage of that message do you think is retained the way that you thought it? Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. I think it's like less than 25% of that mm -hmm. message is received the way that you have intended it to be received. So you do that only for so long until you figure out, oh, if I am just a little bit less, uh, like a little bit less thoughtful and a little bit more impactful, then I'm going to get my point across a lot more effectively. And so mm -hmm. instead of saying, well, you know, I think that you're like, I appreciate what you're saying, but really, no, it ends up being like, uh, oh, how's it feel to be a stupid fucking bitch? Look at this. <laughs> you know, I have the receipts. Does it feel, does yeah. it feel good that you're dumb? Yeah. Does right. your, is your mom, is your mom like super upset about the way that you've become as a person? <laughs> you know, like, it's just like, it's just like you, you have to like dig in in order to get your point across a little bit more. And it's about like, it's about scoring points instead of making points. And exactly. so, yes. Yep. yeah. I, and so it, it just disintegrates into absolute chaos. But what's interesting about it. And the one thing that, you know, I think we all know this, but, but we tend to forget it that like, I also think that the percentage of people who talk the way they talk online versus how they would talk to somebody in person is also in that low 20th percentile, right? Like anything oh, I yeah. say on this podcast or online, I am not afraid to talk about in person. Yeah. And I can say that. And I know I can back that up. Mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of people can't say that. And when they're confronted with something like that, then their true colors show. But the internet has given us an avenue to where we can act fool and and it's like an outlet for the worst of us, the worst part of us with no repercussions. The feedback, the reverberation isn't a punch to the face because you said something rude to somebody, right? We, and you'll find more and more people that like agree with you. So you kind of build this like fan club of like people behind a lot of the same information or the same point of view where it's like you, I feel like you have more of a cockiness there than you would in person you know, talking on your own facts and, and like trying to speak on information where you just kind of have like this gang of like support right. online, you know, and, and whether it's groups or whatever it is. And in a positive light, that's a really good thing. If you're talking about God, I don't know, it could be about anything like, uh, I, w I was going to use sports, but even that gets really nasty, like really dirty, like a community, uh, pickup group or, you know, some you people go. that are doing good people. A food uh, bank. Yeah. That, I'm trying to think of something like a little, 
like not so innocuous something like uh like what's a topic that's positive that people can rally around that that has made been made better by the internet i don't know like maybe like uh like an alcoholics anonymous or some sort of support group for something that you're going through maybe you're in a lot of credit card debt and you found a community of people who have gotten out of credit card debt and they're like kind of picking you know that kind of thing where you find your you find your uh you find your tribe and and it's actually really helpful and positive what about the uh gamestop dogecoin reddit people you think that is that a good example it's incredible yeah. Yeah. yeah i think it's i think that's awesome i think it's i think it's fascinating the way that that kind of community can roll around together because even though they're trying to like stick it to the man and they're trying to inflict as much pain into <laughs> into traders as possible by 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 buying stocks that they shorted i mean I, even though like i still think it's i think it's still think it's like mostly positive because they're they're trying to improve their situation and you know that's give and take. Uh, but, but I think mostly when you're talking about hot button issues, really, really controversial things, and, and you're trying to have a discussion about that, you're, you're never going to make somebody uh, or, or, or change anybody's mind. You're never going to have somebody see it your way. And so then you're going to feel so upset because now you are misunderstood. Yeah, and right. you feel misunderstood. And so that that angers us when we feel misunderstood because not only are we misunderstood, but then there's name calling involved. And so it's like, wait, wait, you think this of me because of the way I thought, but, but th- that's not how it is at all. And like, you're you're an asshole because you know, you're doing this, that, and the other. And it just goes back and forth. It turns into a big pissing match. And, and, and so I, I totally agree with this guy. He's like, I, I wish that you all would just, just stop indulging in the worst of human behavior for just a little bit so we can get the shit back on track. Mm-hmm. But anyways, he goes into Elon Musk now. He, he finally talks about why he thinks this is a bad idea for Elon. He says, Elon is not going to fix some problems. I'm absolutely sure of this. He has no idea what he's in for. Elon is going to try like heck to, quote, fix problems he sees. Each problem he fixes will just cause three more problems. And the worst part the part that is going to hurt all of humanity is that this will distract him from his mission at SpaceX and Tesla because it's not just going to suck up his time and attention. It will damage his psyche. Yeah. Damn. Yeah, you could. I believe that, dude, for sure. He goes on. I mean, it's not like he hasn't already. He's not already an emotionally damaged guy. I don't know really what that means, uh, but he's overcome a lot and he does not need more trauma from running Twitter. And he says, I know because I'm not just protecting my own traumas from the time of running Reddit. Mark Zuckerberg talks about e-foiling in the mornings to avoid having to think about bad news coming in. That's like, quote, being punched in the face. E-foiling is like that. Uh, it's like that surfboard. You just like bounce up and down and you just generate your own motion. You know what I'm talking about? You've seen yeah, that, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, Ellen Powell, uh, former uh, CEO of Reddit, was horrifically scarred by her run as CEO uh, and the act of harassment far beyond merely adjudicating community misbehavior. Jack Dorsey, uh, ex-CEO of Twitter, has meditation retreats and unusual diets. Um, and he says, yeah, he's an odd guy, but I'm pretty sure some of that has has to do with the reason that he's coping with all you fucking assholes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he says, he says, it's not a fun job. And it's not like anyone on the outside imagines. Elon is a very public personality, and he will be faulted by all sides anytime Twitter does anything to solve a problem, even if he isn't the CEO. So his final take is, Elon, I am all with you on the values of the old internet. This is not the old internet that is gone. It is sad, and it's not because the platforms killed it. It is because we brought all of our old, horrible collective dysfunction onto the internet, and the internet is very fast, and everyone can say anything to anyone, and the place where that happens is happens the most is on the social platforms. So yeah, he basically is like, look, dude, you don't know what you're... Uh, you don't know what you're getting into, and uh, I, hope you, I hope you see the light. But it sounds like he's continuing on, so who knows, man? Who knows? Good find, though. That was a really good... You sent that to me, and I was like, oh, wow. That's, that dude, I don't know what the fuck he does now, but he has got some powerful insights, for sure. Yeah, he's very thoughtful. Um, he works with uh, Real Atoms, which is an entire month of shows all on its own. I re- I won't even get hmm. into it right now. It, it is interesting. He, he makes a point in one of the earlier tweets in that thread where it's like the internet used to be like kind of how he's saying Elon's from the old internet, but like a place of, of like freedom. And it was not as many people were on the internet, but now it's like today, everyone is there. That is the place. That's the battlefield. I think he calls it, but like that's, that is just Mm -hmm. like where this all goes down. It's so different now than what it used to be. And the dude, it's what 20 some years, maybe that the internet's really been the internet. And it's like our entire lives are dictated by it now in every way. And that's our main Mm -hmm. form of communication. Damn near. It seems like, 
Like it's just it's it's wild, dude. Like it, it makes me scared for what the next fifty years looks like for for like us and and like for our, my kids, our, you know, kids generations. It's like, what is that world gonna look like, man? Like, are they even gonna have a real world, or is it just gonna all be metaverse? Like, it's just, I don't know. You can think in, in circles about it. Like, it goes kind of go crazy with it, but you can. But also, I think there's things that you can look at that'll bring you back to the ground. Um, because it's said a lot, and I think it's not said enough. The Twitter is not real life. Even though that's where the things happen, like that's where people have those discussions. It's not real life. I mean, we just talked about how people are not this way in person. Right? Yeah, Even yeah. if you feel a way, like you're going to be way more passive about it because you don't want problems with people that you don't, like you can't size up, right? You can size up a screen. You can't size up a person, like not nearly as good. So there, there's a, uh, uh, back in March, the Pew Research Organization came out with a, uh, with an article and it's called uh, five facts about Twitter lurkers and Twitter lurkers are uh, the people who are considered infrequent users or infrequent tweeters. They, they uh, post an average of fewer than five tweets a month. And what's interesting is not about the lurkers, but about the percentage of people that actually tweet. I mean, I've had a Twitter for probably 10 years and I think I've maybe tweeted 20 times, maybe. Yeah. I tweet never. I'm on it all the time. <laughs> yeah. I tweet never. <laughs> but 20, uh, 25% of Twitter's users make up 97% of all tweets. Damn. Holy shit. Isn't that wild? Wow. So it's only a very few amount of people that are talking and that are driving the conversations. Um, frequent Twitter or frequent tweeters, uh, not surprisingly land in the age group of 18 to 29 year olds. 41% of frequent tweeters are in that age group. 32% of frequent tweeters are in the age group of 30 to 49. And 20% of frequent tweeters are in the age group of 50 to 64. And then on the other end, the infrequent tweeters, 14% are in the age group of 18 to 29. 59% are in the age group of 30 to 49. So 30 to 49 year olds are the mo overwhelming majority of Twitter users that are just watching Twitter. And then again, 20% of 50 to 64 year olds are infrequent Twitters, Twitters. Yeah. So it's mostly young people that are making up the conversation, most of the conversation on Twitter. And it's a very select few of all Twitter users that are making up the, the, the overwhelming majority. I think we can confidently say all of the conversation on Twitter is made up by 25% of its users, which is wild. So I think if you look at that and take that perspective, you can say, all right, well, I feel a little bit better because honestly, man, how often do you walk out in the world and, and experience the, the things that you see all day on Twitter or on the internet? Maybe I'm overgeneralizing, but I would say that a large majority of my interactions are overwhelmingly pleasant. <laughs> you know, like I don't yeah. ever have like unnecessary drama with people ever. It's no, yeah, no, that's true. And that's not to like to diminish anyone else's experiences, but I, I do, I agree with you. It's like, I, you, you can read the internet sometimes be scrolling through internet, through Instagram, Twitter, and like, just think this place we live is just like the fucking worst. And it's like you walk outside and, and you know, hi to your neighbor, whatever the fuck you go do, whatever. It's fine. Like no trouble. Fuck, I, yeah, I, that's a good point. I, I don't know. Yeah, man. So uh, that's where it's happening. That's where the discussion is happening. But but that perspective of, look, it's the worst of us. The way these things are set up do not facilitate our best behavior. We know this through years and years of examples. And the majority of what's happening is made up by the minority of people. So but how, I think, you can't fix that though. You can't like tell people how to act really without banning. No, you know, no, like, you can't, but you can, but you can put a mirror up to their face. You can, you can show them what they're doing and just hope that they have the humility and the, and the, and the, sh and the shame to, to, you know, rewire their, their their doings i don't mean because yeah what else can you do right what else can you do and if they're going to continue to censor behavior and not topics the way that Yashan was talking about well then you know keep doing what you're doing you're you're, you're gonna get uh you're gonna get dinged for it uh somebody who's gotten dinged for continuing to do what they've done is netflix did you know that netflix is like becoming increasingly unpopular i did not know this I found out the last week, so I don't know. What, I had no clue. Yeah. They, well, they announced like some opening numbers and like some upcoming expectations for what they are are projecting that they're going to see, and it does not look good, bro. They had a really bad stock week. Yeah, they did. They <laughs> lost thirty five percent of their of their uh, stock value. Mm -hmm. nice. They lost fifty four billion dollars of wealth in a week. I had no clue they were in trouble. Yeah, I saw, I saw something that said they were down like two hundred thousand active users in the first quarter, and they projected. Coming up, they'll be down two million, mm. which is just uh, mm. I, I, 
weird to me because I, to quote uh, Netflix chairman and co-CEO, it's a bitch. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Those were his words. <laughs> yeah. And now it sounds like they're, they're mulling around the idea of like, okay, well now it's time to crack down on, you know, password sharing. And to me, it's like, dude, that's like the worst thing you could do right now. I, feel I was like. going to say, man, like you, you, you're, you're losing subscribers. I don't know. Maybe they think by cutting people off, are going to make them subscribe. But if you're not very popular, <laughs> it's not, it doesn't seem like a good time. It seems like you're, you're selling high. Or yeah. you're selling low yeah. and buying high. But I mean, I did know that they spent, a, I know that they had like an ungodly amount of debt. How much debt does Netflix have right now? It's an insane amount because they were doing all of their original programming. I didn't know this either, but they had 500 original uh, programs last year. 500. Wow. Damn. Yeah. And it takes a lot of money to produce that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. especially when you're using A list actors. So this is. July 22nd, 2021 data. Total debt. You ready for this? $17.8 billion. Jeez. I mean, okay, so it's not a, look, it's not a huge issue until <laughs> you lose all of these, uh, uh, all of these subscribers. Then, yeah, it's a giant problem. I, I don't know, man. I think Netflix is going to make it. They're like a blue chip in this streaming subscription era. They're exploring ad supported subscriptions Ugh. Ugh. Yeah, imagine paying does. for netflix and watching ads that, well hulu has ads and ad free you can pay like i think it's five bucks more a month or something and you have ad free content Got but it. Got i it. do that and i still have ads anything that's new you still have ads for it's just the older shit that's on there oh, lame. so they don't they don't tell you that yeah to me it's just, dude i don't know what the answer is because now it seems like we basically have cable where you choose what channels you want is what it seems like. Cause you have Netflix, prime, Hulu, HBO, Apple TV, Epic, Showtime. Yeah. You have all these HBO different Max. things and it's like, okay, if I'm Netflix, I'm trying to buy those motherfuckers. If you can, I don't, I don't know what their financials are or whatever, but like make a cake, like it's literally going to turn back into like a cable network and it kind of already is with like Hulu ESPN uh, I think HBO, Warner Brothers, they just partnered with, like, they bought like Discovery. They're all part of the, the mm-hmm. Discovery channels now. I, I think that's what you're going to see people do because it's like consumers, I don't want to have 15 different subscriptions to watch the shit no, I want to watch, bro. It's, it's no. stupid. Yeah. And, it's that's why, and that's why cable is so great, right? Because it consolidates all that stuff. And I recently got rid of cable. I was getting charged $200 a month for internet and cable. And mm-hmm. I was like, wow, that's a lot of money. Mm-hmm. And then I looked at how many things I was subscribed to and how many things I got included in that cable package that I was subscribed to. And I was like, oh shit, this actually makes sense. And then I wanted to listen to this shit. This is the dumbest thing I've ever done in my life. I like to watch Padre games and I live in San Diego, the market where the Padres play. I cut the cable cord. So I no longer got the station that played the Padre games. And I thought I had a solution by buying the MLB.TV subscription. It's $100, $120 for the year. Uh, I go to, I, I go to watch the first game and I'm blacked out because I'm in my own network. Uh-huh. And I have no recourse other than to have a cable subscription. So what do I do? I buy a VPN. That way I can stream my internet from a different location in the world. So I'm not technically in the market. Then <laughs> if I wanted to do that, I would have to sign my, I would have to log my, I would have to log my TV into a hotspot on my phone where I can stream the VPN because my TV has the MLB app. And if I want to get around that, then I had to buy a router. So I bought a router, but I didn't know that the modem that I was using from eight from Cox Cable was also a modem router. So I couldn't route the internet through this router. I had to buy another modem oh my so that God. I can install a VPN on my router so I can just watch a fucking baseball game. <laughs> they better win the series this year. God damn it, they should. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm like, okay, I've spent 300 bucks on this internet uh, setup. Um, and... I'm just thinking about like ter- like returning all of it and just fucking buying cable. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, there was a stat just... I remember seeing last year a bunch and it said the number of Costco memberships was higher than the number of US households that paid for cable TV and Oh wow. That's that's that yeah, that's a crazy stat, man, but I feel like I I don't know if they're going to go back to Comcast or Cox or like whatever, but like, I feel like that maybe that's what those companies need to do because they can't, I don't think survive on just supplying internet. Like I did the same thing like four or five months ago, got rid of cable, kept my internet service and just picked and choose my a la carte bundle with, Mm -hmm. you know, Hulu, HBO, whatever the fuck. But like, 
there's so many. I, I just think that like Cox or Xfinity are going to have to go in and buy a Netflix, buy a H, like buy these things and make their own chunks again. Or I, I just, I just don't know, dude. It's, as long as these networks continue to have the contracts they have, then cable will live on. Yes. Yeah, I think so. But like those company, I don't know. Can they stay alive as internet companies? They're mainly internet providers now, though. I feel like. Yeah, but like think about it. Any sports, any sports network, any anybody who shows any sports, they have the monopoly on that market. So that right there doesn't allow. So like the Padres used to play on Channel Four San Diego, which was public access. Mm-hmm. That means I could slap an antenna on this window and I could watch a Padre game because I'm in San Diego. I got that channel in San Diego. That was the frequency that I got on Channel Four, and I got to watch the games. That's not the case anymore. It's Bally Sports now, which has got a contract with MLB, and they show the games on Channel sixty fifty six, something like that. Mm-hmm. And you need a cable subscription to get that. If you don't have a cable subscription, you're not going to watch a game. Now, think about any NFL team that has a has a, a market, any MLB team, any NHL team, NBA. It's the exact same thing. And then you look at uh, uh, the national networks. If I wanted to, I have an ESPN Plus subscription, but I can't watch ESPN because I don't have a cable subscription. I have to watch the ESPN Plus programming. I can't watch SportsCenter when it's on at 8 o'clock at night on the ESPN app because I don't have a cable subscription. What you need to do then is get the Hulu bundle because then you can do that. Because then you get all of ESPN Plus, all the Disney Plus, and Hulu with live TV for like 70 bucks a month. I have the ESPN Plus. That's what I'm saying. But then you, you, should can't... Be, you can watch, if you have Hulu, if, if you have that bundled, you can watch SportsCenter. I do it every night. I yeah. promise you. Okay. <laughs> what, what I think, right. though, like, I'll look into it. Th- that's a good example. ESPN Plus, ESPN Plus just partnered with the NHL this last season, and you can watch any single game, both broadcasts. Mm. So I can watch, the if the Red Wings are playing the Blackhawks, I can watch the Chicago broadcast. Or the Detroit broadcast, no matter where I'm at. That's Just, incredible. Yeah, and that's that's what this needs to happen, bro. Fuck Bally's. Fuck uh, like all these like the ne- Yankee network, like Fox Sports Detroit. Yeah, dude. Like it. I mean, no, no. It's good that they're there, but the only way that those places I think ultimately survive is if they partner with these bigger streaming platforms and get rid of that blackout bullshit and sign exclusive things like with ESPN Plus or whatever streaming platform to say. You can watch all our games, like NFL Sunday ticket. You can watch any game, all season, guaranteed. It's going to Apple Plus, by the way, Apple TV. Is it really? Ticket? Uh, the Sunday ticket. Not Sunday ticket, uh, Red Zone. So if you own... Wow, oh, that sucks. So if you own... So Red Zone is going to be decoupled from Sunday ticket. So if you have Apple TV, you automatically have Red Zone, or you still have to upgrade? I don't know. Okay. It's not finalized. Yeah. But that's where it's going. Okay. Man, dude, yeah, it's... It's all being. That's another thing. I'm, I can't live without Red Zone. I know, man. You, that's pretty easy to find a stream of online, though. <laughs> well, anything is really. If you put the effort into it, you can cut cable and you can pirate shit from anywhere you want. I just, I, I, I like the ease. I like the. Uh, I'm a man of leisure, Al. I feel you. I feel you. I'm a man of leisure. Are you a? Uh, all right. One actually, one quick story just before I get out of here uh, and start reading. I was about to go into the ad read, but I've had a cool little story here, and I'm not. I, not very long, but Tennessee just passed the bill yesterday, which I think is very interesting. I think it's a very good approach. I think it's a fresh take on how to handle something like this without uh, jumping to maybe like the drastic measures of an eye for an eye and bring the death penalty into it and all that kind of stuff. But you've lost me <laughs> in Tennessee. They passed the bill yesterday. This is now a law uh, that would that requires drunk drivers who would kill a parent in a car crash to then pay the child of that kid child support until they're 18 years old and i i can't get behind it more huh i I think it's such a great idea man like you're you're taking you're taking away like the argument behind it is you're taking away the sole caregiver provider for that child something needs to be done to you know make amends for that yeah for sure man for sure i mean think about it like you're uh let's say you're back i'm sure there's plenty of you know two parent one child home or one one parent, one child home, mm-hmm. and you kill a parent, and that kid has no recourse, going to get thrown into the system, you know. Yep. And and you know maybe he maybe he maybe prior to that he would have had to sue, which ah oh, fuck, dude, what a slap in the face. Hey, your 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 parent is dead, and then you got to fight in court to get money yeah, for lawyer it. Lawyer up, right? Yeah. Yeah. Dude. Yeah. 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 No, this is awesome, man. Yeah. Hey. Good for Tennessee for for balancing themselves out. They could, they're gonna, you know, you can go to Tennessee. Uh, you can uh, marry a sixteen uh, year old under uh, religious <laughs> grounds, and then uh, if your kid 
happens to be without a parent, you yeah. can also get uh, yeah child support. So I, I think it's a good idea. Hopefully it makes people think twice. You know, if you go out there, obviously no one wants to kill anybody, but if you do kill someone, you have to live with that weight on your chest on top of having to financially support a kid. Uh, it says there's not going to be like a set amount. It'll go on a case by case basis based on like remaining family members and how actually taking care of that kid will be, et cetera. But pretty interesting. It says on average, 28 people are killed uh, in drug driving crashes every day in the U.S. Every day, 28? Yes, which means that more than 10,000 people are killed every year and drunk driving accounts for 30% of all of the traffic fatalities. Wow, that is far too high of a number. Yeah, I agree. I totally agree. Oh my God, I had no idea. So think about that. 10,000 people a year die in a car accident. I guess that makes sense. I guess that makes sense. I mean, it's a dangerous, bro, you're moving at very quick speeds. One, one little... Lack of one glance down at your cell phone, one mm -hmm. not looking in your blind spot, like traveling at 70 miles an hour, it can go quickly. So it can go quickly. Um, you know what else goes quickly, Al? Uh, me after I drink coffee in the morning. Uh, yeah, you got it. That's not where I was going, but <laughs> where were you going bud? first? And then I'll, I'll get there. My stash of gun barrel coffee goes quickly. Yeah, me too, man. I need to holler at them guys because I'm officially out myself. Um, but that's because I like to drink good, smooth cups of coffee. It's a treat all by itself. But if I can do that and help American heroes, it's that much better. Do it all the time. Love these guys. Our sponsor, Gun Barrel Coffee. They're proud to donate $1 from every item purchased to veterans and first responder charities all across our country. The way they do this is that they offer 14 different blends and roasts, which you could get in whole bean, ground, or single serve pods, whatever your flavor. Pick your poison. Pick your methodology. They got it for you. Right now, as a friend of our ship, you can use the promo code FNH10. You'll save 10% at checkout when you buy their products at gunbarrelcoffee.com. That is promo code FNH10. Gun Barrel Coffee, damn good coffee, damn good cause. Uh, make sure you hit the links in our bios on all of our social platforms and check out our shop. We've got all kinds of shit. Frank's wearing the dad hat right now, which I've heard is very nice quality. Of the uh, of the utmost highest regard. I don't even know the words I'm saying right now, but it's good. Uh, T-shirts, boxers, all kinds of things. That, And if you see something that we don't have up there that you want, you just let us know. I'll sit down. I will design it to your exact specifications and get you the Friendship News Hour merch that you deserve. Frank, where can they find all this stuff at? What's he doing now? Oh, my I'm God. not done pimping our shit. Oh, okay. What, what else we got here? Is it a T-shirt? This is an, this is an un, unboxing. Um, this is not for me, but this is one of our our tanks. Ooh, these are the racer bags. Thank you, Patrick and Alicia Davison, for the suggestions. Ooh, that's Wouldn't nice. Work out in that. It's yeah. very nice. It's very soft. Man, it's my arms nice would look huge in that thing too. Man, might have to get one. It's breathable. You oh. look mighty sexy. Oh my goodness, it's so nice. Well, where could they find it, Frank? Like, what what are our social platforms? Our tags? What what where do they go? Well, I'm glad you asked, Al. <laughs> um, <laughs> you guys, you guys, uh, you know where to find us. We're on Twitter at Friendship NH. We're on Instagram and TikTok, same handle at Friendship News Hour. And you can send us an email, bummerdude.media at gmail.com. Bummerdude.media at gmail.com. Uh, if you're still listening, there is a, a very simple one link that you need to click on our, on our Instagram and in our TikTok in our Twitter that will uh, lead you uh, to our merch and uh we really appreciate it we don't make any money off of it uh but it's just cool to get the word out it spurs conversation dalton talked about it last time it it gets people going it's provocative um and also if you're still listening to this we really really appreciate it uh and we would appreciate it so much more if you would give us a like and a review it helps out tremendously to spread the friendship news hour so please uh do that favor for us uh, if you find any value in the show whatsoever. And again, if you don't, why are you here? Uh, so, <laughs> Goodbye. Yes, thank you. Good day, sir. <laughs> or ma'am. We'll see you guys next time. <laughs>